Hey, Rebecca, do you want to start? Uh, should I start? As you prefer. Okay, let me share my screen. Do you have the list of the webinar? Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, good morning from uh, the United States. Uh, it's still quite early here, and it's very, very cold in Wisconsin, uh, but it's nice to be here with uh, many people. Um, uh, this is the first of um, what's going to be a webinar series, we anticipate eight, uh, that address reproductive rights and contemporary and historical economic perspective. And on behalf of Rebecca gomez Bettencourt, Miriam Bankowski, and myself, I'd like to thank you all for being here today. Yeah, oops. There we go. Uh, what I'd like to talk about today is Wixell, Population and Procreation. So the Swedish economist and his contributions to population theory, and also sort of how it fit in with reproductive rights um, and reproductive rights as sort of an economic problem, right? particularly for women in the late 1800s and early 1900s. But this is not a new thing, right? Um, there's been a lot of news recently. Uh, talking about uh, reproductive rights uh, in the United States, right? We had the recent Supreme Court decision. If you've been watching the news this last week out of Asia, right, uh, there's been an endless number of stories about um, declining populations, right? And what Korea, Japan, or China is going to do in terms of pronatalist policies. Mm -hmm. So indeed, since Adam Smith, J.S. Mill, economists have written on poverty remediation, the evils of inequality, and the necessity of general education as it intersected with what they called the population problem. And population policies uh, were simply another uh, form, right? We can look at Malthus, we can look at child's one child policy, and uh, in all cases, Population and procreation have been linked to the economics of poverty, wages, and national economic development. Um, this is also an important uh, topic that intersected with a lot of the different 19th century women's rights movements. Right? In this case, economists and social reformers had identified it that reproductive choice was fundamental to women's economic independence, their ability to work, the types of work that they could get, and what they would be paid. For example, right, we can look at writings by Mary Wollstonecraft, J.S. Mill, and Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Um, family limitation was also important, a uh, component of improved living standards, right? And this was recognized by Malthus, by Marshall, by Pareto. Um, and if we look ahead, right, 50 years in the post-war period, population policy and population control were central components of most economic development policies. Mm -hmm. And then if we become very contemporary, like several of the seminars that we will be hosting uh, later in the series, recent research has demonstrated that family planning, right, including access to legal abortion, is associated with higher wages, higher family incomes, greater labor force participation rates, and expanded human capital investment. Right? This includes work by Claudia Golden, Jonathan Gruber, and Caitlin Myers, for example. What I'd like to start with today is three claims that I think uh, will, it's fun to go first, right? Because then you can just make claims and everyone forgets by the last seminar, but um, three claims that I think uh, will resurface right, throughout the various seminars and explore them within sort of the context of Wixell and late 19th century economics. And, um, The first one is that the role for the economist and for economic theories and social debates is socially constructed and it's a function of historical and cu current cultural context, right? So today economists might be told to, uh, in English, we would say stay in your lane, right? Uh, so economists do economics work, right? It is not our job to comment on social policy. That was not the case right, in Vixel's time. And we will see actually he was pushed to study economics right, to be a more knowledgeable uh, commentator on population issues. 
The second theme is at least in the case of Wicksell and uh, some of the later Swedish economists, it's difficult to impossible to disentangle the economic analysis from the economic policies that they recommended. Uh, so, for example, in the case of Vixel, he identified his policy solution, which is a stationary or declining population, well before he developed the economic theory behind it. And then third, one of the reasons why the economics of reproductive rights becomes so controversial is it inter exists at the intersection of personal and social choices, of micro and macroeconomics. So rational individual choices about childbearing, right, which we could argue are rooted in utility maximization, budget constraints, right, income, choices about human capital investment, labor supply, can be at odds with national policy objectives, which might want to adopt either pro-natalist or anti-natalist policies as related to poverty, economic development, factor productivity, right, GDP growth, unemployment, and welfare state policies. There's any uh, strict methodological individualists here. Uh, we can take up whether or not there can be a social viewpoint on this, but at least for the Swedes, right? Uh, they have a, they're very much comfortable with the idea that uh, in addition to the individual, uh, there can be sort of a societal preference for certain sorts of policies. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, some of these things never change. Right. Um, sorry. Oops. On the left, we have a crisis in the population question, which is a Swedish bestseller in 1934, written by Alvin Gunnar Myrdal. Right. And then just last week in the news, right, we have uh, Asian population policies and, and what we're going to do to increase the population. So uh, Newt Vixell was a Swedish economist, uh, the late 1800s and the early 1900s. He was the leading Swedish economist at the time, the only one with a significant international reputation. He was of the same generation as David Davidson, who's a very conservative economist, and he shared the limelight most of his life with Gustav Kassel, right, who was another uh, fairly conservative Swedish economist. Wicksell, eventually, he had a, a long career as a, a social agitator, public speaker, a pamphleteer, before actually becoming an economist uh, and securing a position at Lund University. And uh, if you look at Wicksell's contributions to economic theory, right, uh, they're everywhere. Marginal analysis, interest rates, money, banking, macroeconomic, business cycles, series of voting, uh, tax rates, and then of course, population. He's widely regarded as sort of the theoretical founder, the, uh, the forefather of the uh, Stockholm School, right? Which include the next generation like Heckscher, Aline, Myrdal, Lindahl. Oops, sorry. Yeah. But of course, before Wicksell was an economist, he was also a social radical. And uh, he wrote and lectured on issues of social justice, uh, something he never abandoned. Um, and you can see I've got two pictures here. One is the massive Swedish emigration to America uh, between roughly, get my dates right, 1850 and 1910. 1 1.3 million Swedes uh, emigrated uh, from the country, including Wicksell's brother. Um, so that was sort of like the big issue of the time, right? Uh, Vixell, of course, attributed the immigration to poverty, right, which is a central theme in all of his work. Uh, for social policies, he advocated for workers' rights, expanded access to education, confiscation and redistribution of inheritances, universal suffrage, reform of the tax system, and legal contraception. In doing so, right, the next generation of economists, they said he had a decisive influence on the evolution and political ideas in our country, said Eric Lindahl. Wicksell played a large part in the remarkable reshaping of Swedish society. Right? In the by the 1920s and 1930s, many of his policies were actually starting to be put into place. So late 19th century Sweden, in addition to emigration, right, poverty, uh, emerging urbanization, emerging industrialization. And uh, so between the immigration and falling fertility rates, uh, Sweden starts to envision a population crisis. 
So between um, in 1820, uh, women had roughly five children, uh, and that had fallen to an average of fewer than three a century later. It'll decline to less than two by the interwar years. And so this was a, everyone. I was talking about this. So labor unions, social reformers, scholars, the clergy, communist suffragists, it was the main topic of conversation at the time. And uh, if you look at like Swedish uh, intellectuals, Edward and George Brandes, Anne Margaret Holmgren, Ibsen, August Strindberg, Ellen Key, right? the population question was a problem for all of them. Uh, actually, if you, I don't know if you can see in the bottom right, but maybe if you close your, your people window, uh, there's a cartoon. Uh, Vixo was um, always at the sort of the forefront of the social debates. Uh, he liked radical opinions and he spent three months in prison uh, for blasphemy. Uh, but his time in prison was fairly comfortable. And this is a newspaper cartoon that shows uh, they're asking them to fetch the prison governor because they need a fourth to play cards with Wixell in the evening. And, but what got him into this? And, uh, in 1880, after several years of depression and sort of he had had a religious crisis and he wasn't really going to classes anymore as a university student. But suddenly in 1880, he reappears and he gives a public lecture on the common causes of drunkenness and how to remove them, right? And his central thesis was that overpopulation and poverty were the root of all of Sweden's social ills. And um, basically the speech was his reading of George Drysdale's take on Neo-Malthusianism, right? Uh, let's see. He says, poverty is the root cause of drunkenness for two reasons. First, miserable overcrowded homes under constant financial stress, right? It's no wonder why people drink. And the second reason was, particularly for students, right, was that uh, they're poor. The education process takes a long time. Uh, they can't get married. So <clears throat> what do they do? They drink and then it's either celibacy or prostitution, right? So have you considered the only fact that this is the, or have you considered the fact that this is the only substitute that they're offered? So Excel says he can solve these two problems, right? Excess drunkenness and uh, prostitution if we would just adopt legal contraception. And everybody freaked out. Right. Uh, the lecture launched Wixell as a public orator and commentator. He made his living at this for more than 10 years. He was enormously popular with the students, the labor unionists, and some of the socialists, although he was a fervent anti-Marxist. So that kind of makes his relationship with the socialists a little different. Um, however, the conservative press, the university, which was quite conservative at the time, right, uh, everyone was uh, up in arms. If you look at a simple search of like Swedish databases and newspapers from the period, there's no zero mentions of Wixell in 1879, and there's more than a thousand right the next year in 1880. Just sort of capture how the extent to which he captured the attention of the entire country. And one woman student wrote from home wrote home that said it would be wonderful if a day or two could pass undisturbed by the mention of this undergraduate Wixell. His cock has caused a sensation like of which has not been seen for many years. He arouses admiration, astonishment, loathing, and hate. And he stirs the passions of all. <coughs> the expected criticisms came pretty quickly, right? And they're really what anyone would expect, right? The immorality of contraception, that legal contraception would induce premarital and early and extramarital sex. It interfered with the rights of the unborn. And then there's all sorts of questionable medical beliefs right, associated with the frequency and nature of sex. The Swedish conservatives rejected legal contraception and equal education for women, arguing that it would undermine population growth, which is necessary for national prosperity, and it would threaten the existence of the Swedish state. You have to remember, right, Sweden, right, Finland was part of Russia for a lot of this time, and Finland was part of Sweden for some of this time, right, and uh, Swedish-Russian relations were extremely fraught, 
uh, all the way back to the 1700s. So the idea that Sweden could easily be overrun, right, and become a, an arm of Russia was very much right in the minds politically. And then another argument was that contraception would open the door to legal abortion. I think what's interesting, if you start to read all the arguments, is there's another piece of this, right, that we might not anticipate um, today, which was that Wixa had failed to study the economics of population properly. Uh -huh. So David Davidson, who held the chair in economics uh, at the University of Stockholm, demanded whether Wixell, and he, when he wrote back as an editorial in the newspaper, he asked Wixell, have you made yourself truly familiar with the various theoretical aspects of the population question, which in his view included addressing socialism? Davidson continues, have you made yourself acquainted with the different views on the possibility of overpopulation and the general laws of population growth? All right. Have you undertaken careful study of the foundations of these theories? Have you read Malthus, which he hadn't at this point? Have you studied Carey? Right. And the University Council actually pushed the same line in its disciplinary hearing for Wixell. They argued that attempts to improve the lot of mankind should be based on extensive study. The Swedish Medical Association suggested he undertake moderately extensive studies in science, economics, right, which he wants to use as a point of departure. So rather than suggesting that this wasn't an economic problem, it was clearly seen as an economic problem, and it was appropriate for economists to comment right, on population and birth control and abortion. It's just that Wicksell was criticized because he didn't have any economics background at this point in time. And in fact, he would come to study economics, although it would take another decade uh, by way of the population question. He argued that population was the most important and at the same time, the most neglected of all social problems. And so for a while, Wixell continues, he writes uh, pamphlets, he gives lectures on immigration, prostitution, marriage, socialism, and poverty, all of which he relates back to neo-Malthusian uh, themes. And, and of course, there's a, a string of scandals, right? The public is scandalized, police interventions, angry protesters. But eventually we get to Wixell's population theories. So over the next several years, right, he continues to get pushed back that he hasn't studied economics. So Wixell begins a program. He goes to London and he sits in on lectures. Um, he reads Walras, Cairns, Jevons, Mill, and Smith. He travels to Lausanne and Berlin, uh, has lectures by Brentano, uh, Adolf Wagner, Menger, and Vienna. And, however, despite his exposure to a, a really broad range of economics at this point, his first and second professional writings were focused on population. One was for a Norwegian economics journal, and the second was submitted for a French competition. He would be pushed back away from population theories for a while in his efforts to get a job at a Swedish university. So he works on his value capital and rent and a lot of public finance work. He had to get a law degree during this time in order to be able to teach at a Swedish university. But he always returns to the population question. So his theory of population, it's a bit ad hoc, right? We get it over the course of maybe 20 years in a lot of different pieces and in a lot of different forms. Um, Vixel himself said one ought therefore to be informed of all the economic conditions that are related to the density of population and the means, and this means nearly all economic phenomena. Yeah. So while some people have dismissed Fixell's population work as not particularly scientific or not particularly original, there are others such as Mats Lundahl, a, Swedish, a contemporary Swedish economist, who argues that if you take it all together, it's possible to envision Fixell's population theory as sort of a general equilibrium analysis. Right? And of course, this is just coming to the fore. We know Fixell's reading Valras at this point. Um, so it's fairly convincing. Wixell's argument was that at least in theory, all the variables in the economic system, including population, affected and interacted with each other. 
foreign trade and international factor mobility. Right? And take Swedish's mass emigration. Right? This is, of course, an interest to them. Interacted with population growth, production, factor accumulation, and factor productivity. And in fact, uh, there's aspects of Wixell's theory that are very close uh, to Samuelson's specific factors approach to international trade. Anyway. Excuse me. Uh, whereas many sought remedies uh, for Sweden's underpopulation, right? Rixell was convinced that the country was in fact overpopulated. And the overpopulation was the leading contributor to poverty and its associated ills. Before, right, becoming an economist, right, we see that Wixell had long argued that the social ills like poverty, drunkenness, prostitution could be mitigated, right, through contraception, legal contraception, and restricting population growth. A smaller population would improve living standards, reduce crowding, right, prostitution would diminish if people can marry earlier, he argued, alcoholism would decline if family life were more harmonious. So that's the social policy, right, that had been widely developed beforehand. The economics, Wixell said, there's really two questions or two problems uh, that should be carefully separated. The first was that there's a physical problem, right, that the human capacity and inclination to procreate will inevitably outstrip what society can reasonably support. Mm -hmm. And for that, right, you're stuck in a Malthusian dilemma. You can have, you have to make a choice. You can either re reduce births or you can increase deaths. No. The second problem was economic, right? Wixel says rather than asking what maximum population can be supported at minimum subsistence, instead we ought to consider what population size and density would guarantee everyone the maximum share of well-being and would thus, economically speaking, be the best. He defined the optimum population as a point where any further increase in population would be met with a decline in average individual welfare. Right. Alternatively, he explained this would occur when the diminishing marginal productivity of labor, right? So dividing fixed capital and land resources across more people was equal to the gains of accruing from the division of labor, right? So you've got sort of this balancing act, right? In Wixell's view, Sweden had already passed the optimum point as evinced by declining labor productivity and increased food imports. Given the adoption of relatively diminishing returns from agriculture when labor or capital intensity is increased, Wixell argued it's no wonder why poverty, want, and misery have been the lot of the broad mass of the population. Ultimately, increases in population could only be sustainable when aggregate output experienced constant growth, fully matching the increase in population. However, Wixell was pessimistic on the scope for technological or productivity improvements to achieve this kind of growth. Instead, he believed the solution lay in a stationary population, and to do this, the only rational choice was the use of voluntary measures of population control. He says there's no other choice besides the Neo-Malthusian program, early marriage but few children, an average of two or three per family, and for the rest, voluntary sterility. All right, so he continued to call for legal government sanctioned birth control, what he called some way of making conjugal relations possible without the woman becoming pregnant. So if we go back to our three claims here, uh, the cartoons on the left or the right uh, are of uh, a Swedish doctor, uh, Hinky Bergensen, uh, who was also a leading advocate of birth control at the time. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about him in a second, but you can see how he's represented as sort of an evil guy, right? He's out uh, trying to pawn birth control in the population. All right, so by the time we get to the 1910s and the 1915s, right, we have a more senior Wixow, right? He's a professor of economics now. However, he was really no less radical. He believed he had an obligation to educate the public on important social issues. And he writes, right, in many different places <laughs> that his foremost duty is to educate the Swedish people and to participate in the public debates. 
Sometimes Bertia Lavigne would later say he would be a fantastical representative of extreme opinions, right? Just to get the opinion out there in the debates. Uh, he kind of liked playing that role. Anyway, uh, the economist is public intellectual it would become a longstanding and important tradition for Sweden, right? They did not worry that uh, commenting on the social debates was going to compromise their scientific objectivity, right? And neither would advocating for specific policies. It was simply their job, right? And they were allowed to travel quite far afield, right? On their expertise as an economist to virtually any kind of social issue. All right, so I previously noted that policy and social recommendations for Wicksell preceded theory in this case, when the theory came, it was wholly consistent with Wicksell's longer held views on legal contraception, right? So, and then the third, right, which is Wicksell's population theory itself was macroeconomic, right? He has a number of different features to this, but it's primarily a statistical study of Swedish population changes, a mathematical representation of optimum population as a function of agricultural productivity and an analysis between the link of population and national economic development, particularly factor growth, technological progress. However, his population policies, right, were both macro and microeconomic. He says his end goal was the greatest possible prosperity of society, individually and collectively. And he was not at all worried that his views were covered by ideology, right? Which still said scholars' individual sympathies and antipathies, their diverse political ideas, their conception, in a word, of the aim of practical and social economic activity, which lends its color even right, to their treatment of theoretical questions. So he was perfectly comfortable with the fact, right, that. Uh, his own personal inclinations and views of things sort of drove the questions that he was interested in as an economist. So his macroeconomic policies were population stationarity, limited population growth, and policies that would encourage greater productivity, particularly of capital. The microeconomic side of the argument is in a lot of ways much less developed for Vixa. And, um, However, right, he seems to find it uh, that this argument is more persuasive for the population. All right, so he doesn't hesitate to link frequent and unplanned childbearing with classical theories of wage determination. He argues that greater reproductive choice would positively impact women's ability to work, women's wage levels, and family income. He wanted government policies that would support better health care, child care, and education. He argued that these would benefit not only families, but the nation, right? investment in human capital or quality over quantity. And actually, Vixel's partner, Anna Bugge Vixel, was a leading feminist and activist of the time. She also wrestled with the population question, right? often in the context related to women's rights. So, the relationship between population growth, women's work, and wage levels was widely canvassed at the time by politicians, social reformers, and scholars. Now, there's a lot of people who claim that expanded opportunities for women's employment would reduce population growth because women's interests would be refocused outside the home. And national economic power, the existence of the Swedish state, were going to be a function of a large and growing population. Both WIC cells right, argue that greater financial security for working class women might in fact have a positive effect on population quality through a reduction in childhood mortality and childhood diseases. All right, so WIC cell in its statistical study of population attributed the inadequate care of children as one of the greatest contributions to childhood mortality along with unsanitary conditions. Rather than returning to religion, and traditional gender roles. Both of the Wixos advocated for better education, improved living conditions, and legalized birth controls to allow families to plan their lives and children more effectively. All, right, all women desire more control of their finance, family's financial well being, Wixel argued. All right, but the challenges faced by working class women, widows, and single mothers were especially steep. In addition to poor labor conditions, limited employment options, and insufficient pay, 
frequent and unplanned childbearing had an outsized impact on their ability to earn a living. Uh, Anna Vixel said, you know, this is a social and political issue of great scope. People are aware that it is the seriousness of working people. This is not the ridiculous demands of women, right? She says, this is a working, a worker's problem, right? Not a gender problem. Vixel himself says, modern workers, like modern women, have wearied of being more or less animals, both beasts of burden and breeding stock. They want to feel they are completely human beings, right? Well, Wixell largely avoided a discussion of abortion. In a late pamphlet, however, he concluded that it should be permitted on the same grounds of legal contraception, essentially. All right, he says, this is a delicate question, right? Personally, it's only in his advanced age that he's been able to overcome the apprehension that is already the nature of the issue, even more than an inherited tradition, right, against it. So Excel recommended uh, explicit criteria when abortion should be allowed. In his view, it should be allowed freely and unrestricted before the third month. However, better and regular contraception was to be preferred right, to making use of abortion as a regular means of controlling fertility. He says it should be available as a last resort, a safe guarantee for the many that absolutely need it. Where there's a conflict between the individual and the state interests, to the extent that the state has an independent interest, right, Wixell advocated that the individual superseded the social or the national interest. This was fairly consistent with all of his politics. In particular, he was an anti-nationalist, uh, which regularly got him into trouble, um, given the general Swedish view of uh, the Russians at the time, including his wife. Um, however, being an anti-nationalist didn't mean he was anti-status. He had a pretty expansive view for government intervention and management of the economy. All right. uh, so a few things that we can say here to wrap up. So we have some time for discussion. And so the world followed Wixell, although of course not as fast as he would have liked. Right. Uh, his contributions to economics were appreciated by the next generation of Swedish economists, although it would take much longer for them to reach the international audience. Regarding social policies, the outcomes were mixed in the short run. Improvements in education and work, women's working conditions were balanced against other constraints. Right. So in 1910, the Swedish parliament passed the Lex Hinke, Hinke's Law, right, uh, forbidding public dissemination of pro of information or products for legal contraception. It was a reaction to the uh, extremely graphic public lectures that were being given um, by the doctor at the time. And Wixell was so aggravated, he threatened to be the first arrested in violation. Uh, his friends managed to talk him out of it. You know, he was uh, getting quite old at the time. Anyway, the law remained in place until 1938. And most of Excel's proposals for redistribution, universal education, universal suffrage, equal women's rights had to wait for the next generation. As Alan Carlson noted, a longtime scholar of Swedish population economics, independent of the Malthusian debate, yet dealing with the broader population question, contraception remained an important issue for the women's movement into the 1940s. Liberals, social democrats, and communists united here in questions of anti-contraception and abortion laws. In the media man, right, Wixell established a long tradition of the economist as public intellectual in Sweden. Right? In his later years, his society moved uh, toward his positions and he became less radical. Right? He held the role of an elder statesman on issues of taxation, monetary policy, and the economic implications of war but also on population. The next generation, Castle, Olin, Myrdal, Lindal, right? they, all, uh, they all followed right, in Wixell's footsteps in terms of their contribution to the public economic debate. Over the long run, right, Wixell was one of the first to place population at the center of the Swedish social debates and pushed for the reforms that would underpin the Swedish welfare state. Of the next generation, right, we have Alva and Gunnar Myrdal, uh, whose crisis in the population question uh, changed the economic path of Sweden for more than half a century. And so the crisis with that, the fertility rate had now fallen to 1.76 children per woman, 
Uh, the sense of urgency was heightened by the Great Depression and looming uh, Second World War. The book itself was highly controversial. And right? it attributed the decline in fertility to changes in the economic role and status of women triggered by industrialization. In order to revert right, to population growth, to counter depopulation, the Miradals argued that you had to invest in a social welfare state focused on the needs of women and children. Um, uh, this book was the, the manifesto of the Swedish welfare state, the founding document of the welfare state. Right? So it holds a very important point right, in Swedish history. And even though its recommendations differ from Wixell, right, it really grows out of the Wixellian population tradition. However, right, uh, one of the biggest controversies is it also set uh, the path for Swedish eugenics policy that resulted in the sterilization of tens of thousands of people who were deemed unfit. So in this sense, the Myrdals diverged from Wixell and population in significant ways. They rejected neo-Malthusianism, the presumption of overpopulation, although they argue, right, in crisis here, that nobody in the future will question that children should be born only as a result of the free choice of their parents. The neo-Malthusian movement in the case of Sweden belongs to history. It is entitled to its monument, but in positive terms, it has nothing more to offer, they declared, right? Uh, and we, the last thing we can maybe mention uh, is that uh, it's, of course, difficult to see how Wicksell would have felt right, about Swedish population in the 30s. He died in the 20s, right, and the Depression uh, really changed things, as did, you know, incipient war. Uh, however, he leaves us with one thought, uh, Wicksell and eugenics, and he was worried that um, the principle of modern so-called racial hygiene, right? For my own part, he remains hesitant before these suggestions because he thought, or was worried that we didn't really know enough, right? About how to identify people who shouldn't procreate to proceed at this point. All right, I think that's a good place to leave it. Thank you. We'll see if there's any comments or questions. Uh... Who want to start? Maybe someone from the master degree or, or anybody else? <coughs> I have some questions to start if the, nobody wants to start. I don't know if if you can stop sharing and then we can see each other if we could in oh, yeah. gallery. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Marianne, uh, for this uh, presentation. You know, to start to start uh, our discussions, to start doing uh, something that we actually we don't have in the literature, and is the the discussion among economists or in economic writings uh, on reproductive rights. So this is a a, a very a very hard work. And because we are starting, I, I will, I will introduce some very simple question or general questions for the discussion. Um, one uh, probably is, if I understand well, uh, do do you have the impression that Vixel didn't do like the political work, the rhetorical work, the like he was not uh, so engaged to go farther in the defense of the uh, reproductive right. Uh, so maybe uh, what we need is more kind of leaders as, as we have in the history of economics. So for example, John Stuart Mill that was in the parliament and did the political uh, work to, to, you know, to convince people, the rhetorical work. The second question is about the link, uh, if, you, if you found a link between when you say in the in Vixel, in the economic questions, you talk about the physical problem. You say that the human capacity to procreate um, and it was inevitable outstrip that the society can support. If in this argument of the physical problem, if you found something like the 
the nature is limited, we need to take care of the environmental things, or if is there any, any reflection of we need to pay, we need to take care of the earth, of the resource, of the natural resource, any kind of, because you know, in United States, in the during the progressive era, the conservation is moving, there is a link between the nature. <clears throat> and the, you know, what here you call the physical problem. And my third question is the super complex link between contraception and abortion. If you can explain a little bit more as you can, uh, uh, maybe you take other questions and we collect the link when you say uh, that in this moment, uh, contraception will open door to abortion. So what is this link? But I don't know if somebody else want to join me on one of my questions about rhetoric or about nature or about controlled birth and abortion or other, if you prefer to collect, feel, feel free, please. I would like to ask something, but I, I was wondering where, where to raise my hand. I can't find it, sorry. Um, should I just go ahead? I, I, I didn't see if yes. there's anyone else. Yeah, hi, um, thanks. Uh, this was interesting. I, I didn't know Big Scale didn't read Malthus before because I was always assuming that his ideas on population would, would derive from, from Malthus. Um, I, I wanted uh, just a clarification on what you said at the end on the, um, on the Myrdal's uh, position on uh, Neo-Malthusianism. Did you say they, they uh, distanced themselves from Neo Malthusianism, because I would have thought the opposite. I mean, his, his work was very neo Malthusian. But yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, um, they, they are, they're trying to build a really complicated argument, the Miradas, the, that you can get population growth mm -hmm. by also uh, allowing uh, universal access to contraception and full reproductive choice at the individual level. Uh, so they argue that uh, women were disenfranchised in the move from agriculture to industrialization. Right? So women used to have economic power on the farm uh, and they were co-producers in a sense, but in the shift to industrialization, right, they became, women became centered in the home and men became wage earners, which gave them sort of, you know, all the economic power and decision making. And so they said that, uh, well, women want, you know, the ability to work too and to pursue jobs and to pursue their independent interests outside the home, right? So they're very much um, in that sort of mind view, but they also really wanted to achieve a uh, growing population for Sweden. And so the way they kind of try to reconcile this is that first, uh, if you give people the choice in childbearing, uh, and then you help support the children right, uh, through education and uh, food subsidies and clothing subsidies and housing subsidies and all these other things, uh, you'll get better quality children. Uh, they're very big on quality. Uh, and then you women might be willing to have more as well, right? Than if they had to like raise them on their own without the help of, you know, the welfare state. But it's, it's um, and it's the same argument they're trying to make right now, I think in Asia, right? That if you like give women more empowerment and you give families more social support, they might have more children. Uh, but at the same time, right, you want the people to have the full choice over whether they're going to have the children or not. And I don't really know if the Myrdals are successful or if anybody else is successful in sort of reconciling right, uh, the, the competing tensions here. But, um, as for Wixell and Malthus, um, it was partly the sorts of books that were available in Sweden at the time, uh, because uh, in terms of publishing and what you could get, I don't think Malthus was available. They got a copy of Drysdale uh, in English and they read Drysdale in English. Um, and that's sort of what spawned Wixell's thinking originally, George Drysdale. Uh, and then from there, they went back and they started to get uh, Malthus and um, Mill and some of these other people and piece it together. 
but a lot of what they did was translating some of this stuff into Swedish, right, for Swedish audiences, because it wasn't being done originally. Thanks. Or the person in the chat, if they'd like to go before me, that's fine. Okay, we'll put Rebecca in charge to decide. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I don't see any question in the chat, but uh, only to, to tell to the students uh, today is only one hour, so tomorrow we continue. Right. So if you prefer to, to ask your questions tomorrow, you can also. Today is only one hour webinar. Okay. My yeah. question. My question, Marianne, was that was fascinating, by the way, so detailed in terms of the relationship between um, uh, the political and social context and the emergence of economic thought. And I really found it interesting too how in the Swedish context there wasn't any debate about whether this was an economic topic. Um, oh, what... <laughs> Um, sorry if this is a bit confused, but perhaps it just comes out of um, real deep interest in what your talk is um, about and some of the nuances and relationships between the British situation and also some other writing. So I had these questions. Um, did the Wixels engage with debates across the channel in the UK? So um, um, I've you've had a look too at Maxine Montagna's um, LSE thesis um, on um, how um, um, Malthus was used, Malthusian thought was used um, by Charles Bradlow and Annie Besant in the case that gained a lot of attention in the UK. Um, that was in 1877. So if he's writing in 1880, was he speaking to those debates to across the channel? Um, that's one question. And then the second question is, did they, um, did the weak cells position themselves on the debates between, on the link between family immorality and poverty in the Lausanne school too? Because there seems to be two different ways of viewing the relationship between family immorality and poverty and ones that family immorality produces poverty because oh, families are responsible for their own poverty because of their bad decisions. And the other one is that it's actually family immorality is caused by drunkenness, prostitution, et cetera, is caused by poverty. And so he seems to be siding with that latter view and that seems to be the view of Voras and not Pareto. Um, does he discuss the other studies of population and relation to family morality in Volros and Perito as well, which were taking place at the same time? Um, so those are my kind of two questions, which are purely selfish because I'm interested. <laughs> yeah. Those are great questions. They're very interesting. Um, and it, it would be a good job for me to go back and uh, read uh, Vixel's writings with an eye to Valraz and Pareto, especially in the Los Angeles School, to see. Because a lot of times his population writings are meant for a more general audience. There's only maybe five that are really, I would say, academic. Um, mm -hmm. And so the ones that are meant for a general audience often talk about things, but they don't cite them. Mm -hmm. right? So you can't go through very quickly and right, follow uh, who the influences are. So it'd be a good question to go back and look more carefully. Uh, with regards to the British, um, the Vixels, uh, in the 1880s and the 1890s, they're very oriented towards Scandinavia. Um, so the conversation was very much with the Danish and the Swedes and the Norwegian. Um, and, and the one sort of major outside influence was the French. And I don't know if it's just because they both read French better than uh, English or German. Although Wixel is pretty good at German. Um, they, the French uh, 
the use of uh, earlier use of contraception, the population debates in France, um, and then uh, some of the French writers uh, were the ones that he talks about more. Who in particular? That's a very good question. I was just trying to think in my head <laughs> without going over here to look for my file. Sure. Because Voris talks about um, a group of um, writers, French writers, that he calls the French spiritualists. Okay. And um, they're the ones that are related to the... Um, that journal that was, oh, geez, I'll have to go back to my notes too and have a look. Um, um, but I think they included um, the same, but just the, I'd have to double check. Yeah. But um, just, and they were the, for Voros, he thought that they were, actually blaming families for their immorality, um, for their poverty, because it was their immorality and bad decisions that had caused their poverty. Um, so it's, again, seems like it's a bit different to that. This is a, this is a really interesting little, uh, a, a string, I think, to follow here. Yeah. between uh, Valraz and the influence on Vixar and uh, the French. And um, the other question that I had was, so Alfred Marshall, um, you know, when he deals with Malthus, it's kind of to show how Malthus was wrong and that, you know, population could increase much more than um, Malthus had anticipated with his account with Malthus's account of the relationship between agricultural production and population growth. Um, but it sounds like weak cells using Malthus um, in a non-critical way. Is that true? Do you think? I think uh, weak cell accepted. Or the premise, right, that uh, the resources were constrained, not necessarily environmental resources, but agricultural productive resources mm -hmm. and land resources were constrained, and they weren't going to grow as fast as the population would like to grow. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I don't know why he accepted that essentially uncritically, except that it, it's it's a piece of all of his work and he never assumes that you know we can uh innovate our way out of the problem right with better technologies he didn't think that uh despite living through the industrial revolution he didn't think that agricultural productivity was going to be that influenced by uh any sort of technological innovation mm. but maybe that's something we can discuss more after we hear about uh marshall <laughs> yeah. in two weeks I think Maybe. right uh, just over a week I think yeah yeah <laughs> I better get get it finished <laughs> I think that's one of the fun things about a webinar is you can be somewhat more speculative and then you get some pushback and you're like oh I guess I can't say that but maybe And and we can continue the conversations in the other in the other one. I don't know if there is any other question. Anybody uh, that wants to say something? Yes, please. Yes, um, thank you very much. Um, again, I have very speculative uh, question, uh, thought, comments. Um, the first one is just like I have no idea when exactly. Um, demographer craft a sort of statistical um, theory about demographic transition um, that, I mean, in I think it's in the 30s, but I'm, I'm not sure. And so I was wondering, uh, basically, Vixel and in the Swedish context, what was the sort of state of data on, on population and if there was like um, also purely, not purely because it's never purely uh, statistical, but like 
basically discussion on numbers um, and on the, the causal analysis of some major shift. I'm saying that because I think in the US, for example, there is some um, debate on uh, the rate of divorce mm -hmm. and the, the causal effect of the increased education of women or other aspects and things like this. And so I think, yeah, those debates are theoretical and also at the moment they, they're also gathering a lot of data. And, and so I, I was wondering big cells use of, of, of data in general. Um, and I, I was also, I had the same question about the um, engagement uh, uh, with other intellectual on those question, because I didn't know actually. <laughs> um, and uh, Bugo, again, I don't know how you pronounce that. Uh, she's she's next to Melissa Fawcett in many picture, but not many, like one picture I actually used. And so I remember, um, uh, I didn't make the relationship, even if there was Vixel uh, written next to her second second name. Um, so she was, I think, very, she interacted with sort of like international feminist um, uh, organization. And I just wonder, you, you, yeah, can you tell us a little bit more of the relation between the two? Because it's interesting they later influenced the Myrdal and as couples in, in sort of the history yeah. of IBs, it's really interesting. And I just wonder if this is a Swedish tradition or what, I mean, just, yeah, I would like to hear you a bit more about the, their collaboration. Um, and um, uh, yeah, and that, that, um, I, I also wanted to emphasize that this is uh, the first point you're making about what is an ec economic problem in which, um, um, context, uh, especially historical period, I'm very much um, surprised, basically, that what was where major economic problem at the time are not completely reflected in the history of those periods, but like, uh, especially in the history of economics. So for example, I knew much more about the Vixel theory of monetary circle and what he would do on, I have absolutely no idea the way I was taught history of economics, uh, that he, first of all, was seems to be a radical reformer, uh, was also working on other issues. It may, be, it may be due to what you mentioned at the end, like he published in pamphlet, most of his thought on population, rather than in theoretical paper. Mm -hmm. uh, but also it was a major uh, problems at the uh, of the time. So I wonder for the um, uh, webinar more generally, I think this is also uh, about like what we, our conception of economic problems is is really history, yeah, um, uh, an historical construct. And at the time, population was an obsession, and it was really, really at the center of those debates. And I think this is not completely present in the way we talk about this period. Um, I'm, I'm talking ahead of the 19th century uh, to the post-war period um, and after, of course. So yeah, just my my mumbling. Um, thanks. Uh, there's a uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting topics to take up. Um, I think uh, Wixo on the data it's it's pretty quick. They had a the Swedes had a census right, and they had some regular data collection uh, for tax purposes. Um, and in 1914. Vixel actually like goes into the data again for a couple of years, uh, been working in various government offices in collaboration. And so he uses uh, the census data to sort of track population growth. And what he's looking at in particular is not divorce, but late marriages, because the Swedes had sort of developed this tradition over the last half century of very late marriage, meaning in the upper 20s or early 30s. And uh, he's talking about how this, you know, all by itself is going to reduce uh, population growth. Um, and it was driven primarily right, by economic concerns that they, they couldn't afford to marry and set up a household uh, before, you know, many years of work and savings. Um, but it's a the the one the 1914 paper is it's a it's very short but it's quite interesting this use of data. Um, on on Anna Vixel, he they met at an international feminist uh, uh, conference. Uh, she is actually Norwegian, 
uh, eventually uh, they set up house together and uh, she was a major contributor right to the Swedish feminist movement uh, she's one of the earliest women elected to city council uh, she found a loophole in the law that let property women women who owned property be able to vote in local elections um, that they named after her uh, um, and after World War I, she became a major figure uh, for international peace. And she was a Swedish representative to uh, the League of Nations uh, on several committees. And so she, that's probably where she, we get the photos of her with a lot of the other leading uh, international feminists of the period. She traveled. She traveled widely uh, uh, to the United States, to England, uh, throughout Europe, uh, as sort of Sweden's peace ambassador in the 1920s. We could talk about her all day, but probably we should. <laughs> So I think we can stop here and we continue uh, in the next webinar. Yeah. yeah. So next webinar will be Miriam uh, Bankowski. Uh, next Tuesday, is it? Super. And yep. for the students, see you tomorrow. Thank you very um, much, Marianne. Thank you. I really appreciate all the comments and, and very insightful questions. It should keep me uh, busy uh, for quite a while. Thank you. Bye.